Hi, this is Larry Greenblatt. I want to um, show you how I use Wireshark to explain some uh, encryption services. And this is a um, redo of a presentation I gave at Sharkfest in, at both uh, 12 and 13 uh, in Berkeley. And um, I'm going to record it because some of the audio got a little messed up. I was walking around too much and stuff. A little bit about me. I'm a musician primarily. I like to, in fact, that was my goose and I just banged into. Um, and uh, I'd make no money at that. I've been in the same band for over 30 years. Uh, these guys I grew up with. In fact, I don't ever remember not knowing Henry. Um, we formed a band as teenagers, and we have yet to record a hit. Well, we've recorded many songs. Our producer, Otto Kevabianka, was actually the producer for the Roots' first album, Organics. Look it up. Pretty interesting. Um, I've also studied martial arts since I was a little kid, and here I am uh, at my promotion for my third degree black belt with Linda Lee. Bruce Lee's widow came there. That was interesting. It was not to see me. She came there to see my teacher, Joe Lewis, the founder of the Joe Lewis Fighting System. And uh, Joe uh, developed cancer, and we knew he was going to pass. He was a good friend of Bruce's, and apparently a very good friend of uh, Linda's personally, and she came to speak for him. So, great honor to get my picture that taken next to her. Um, neither of these pay much money, uh, so I have a day job that I've maintained, you know, just to keep the things going. Uh, I've been working on computers. I started out as a PC repair guy in uh, 1984. Uh, actually, I started a little bit earlier. I got my Commodore 64. I was, uh, I was on the bulletin boards hacking around known as Max Quasar. Um, but um, I started doing it for a living, and, and uh, eventually... Uh, became a, a consultant, an author, instructor. Uh, I wrote, co-wrote these books uh, for the Certified Ethical Hacker Guy. I've been involved in hacking. I carry that. Uh, actually, I only wrote about one twentieth of this book, by the way. Uh, Steve Defino, this is really mostly his book, did a great job. Uh, I, well, as I pointed out to Steve, my name is in the same font size, so to my mom it's the same. So. Now, I wrote the crypto section. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of Internetwork Defense. We're a training and uh, security company, a consulting company. I've been in Network Dweeb for a long time. My IBM PC certification, Novell CNE, IBM Advanced Connectivity in 88. That's when I learned about the uh, TCP IP model and how uh, it was going away because OSI is going to take over and TCP IP is dead. That's what they told us. Certified Ethical Hacker uh, since 2002, uh, CCNP plus security, and the first hacking class I ever took, first book I ever read it was by Foundstone, and they had a class uh, in 2001 called Ultimate Hacking Hands-On. Uh, also, we've got security guidelines from my mother. I grew up in North Philly. That's my mother right in front of her house today, where I grew up. Spent the uh, first 23 or 24 years there in Logan. Uh, she's always very suspect of anyone, so whatever somebody tells you is not necessarily true, she told me. That's what they want you to think, right? You always hear about the things you think you know, or the things you know that you know, the things you know that you don't know. But what you didn't know that you didn't know that gets you, and that's not always true. It's often what you thought you knew turned out to be wrong. So as a martial artist, you could be a great uh, a gym fighter, right? But out on the street, people don't say, ready, set, go. They'll say something like, hey, what time you got? When you look down at your watch, they suck you. Because right? that's what I wanted you to think. Right? That's how phishing attacks work. That's how, uh, uh, you know, the, oh, I thought that was my bank. That's what I wanted you to think it was your bank. What, were you going to run something called evil virus? No, you ran something that said, hey, it's your bank. Or whatever I want you to disguise it as. Or I'm going to disguise it as what I think you'll run. Uh, she's always suspect that people are trying to get you. They want your money. That's how they get you, Larry. You know, even, you know, take it to the Chinese buffet. And, and don't... Uh, uh, fill up on the breads and the rice, Larry. That's how they get you. You, you eat the meat. You eat the fish. Uh, or they get you coming and going. That was uh, one of her famous lines. Uh, 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 That's what she's really upset. First they raise the price, Larry, and now they tax it. They get you coming and going. She's also very well read and in many different uh, European languages. She can tell you the Latin and the Greek origin of any word. So often like uh, the father from my big fat Greek wedding. Guidelines for my band, um, no matter what you give these guys, they're going to see weapon potential of it. So um, always, uh, as I say, my drummer, I showed him my phone, my um, uh, first smartphone, and, and I'm showing him, look, you can see this video of us on, on the YouTube, and we're watching. He's going, hey, that's pretty hard, man. Imagine I clocked you upside the head with his phone. Dude, probably, you could mess somebody up with that, huh? They let me bring them on an airplane? Yeah, that's how they see it, you know, so, you know. Give somebody email. Other people are like, oh, that's great. We can mail you. And other people are like, what, with attachments? How big? 10 megs? Imagine I kept sending you 10 meg attachments. Boom, 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 boom. Well, you could mess somebody up with it. Uh, I'm going to borrow something from um, uh, 
Bruce Schneier, and I'll bring him back at the end here too. Bruce Schneier is a cryptographer. If you're in cryptography and you uh, haven't heard of Bruce Schneier, you need to. He's a fantastic uh, author, cryptographer, and uh, blogger, just really gets it and, and understand risk management. And he tells the difference, and I believe he was telling someone else's story, but I heard from him, uh, the difference between security engineering and safety engineering. Security engineering deals with Murphy's Law, uh, or, or safety engineering deals with Murphy's Law. If something could go wrong, eventually it will. So you build in checks and, and, and countermeasures. But security engineering deals with Satan's law. If something could go wrong, there's a malicious son of a out there who's going to make it go wrong. Um, some guidelines from Robert and Ten Wilson, and this is why I love uh, Wireshark. Um, you know, Laura Chappell always says, uh, you know, show me the, the packet trace, because packets don't lie. You know, you can have opinions from developers, you can have opinions from users, but packets are something you can measure. Right? So if, if you um, want to speak matter of fact about your network, you, you measure it. And I use uh, uh, you know, Wireshark and Pilot. Actually, Pilot probably more for the overall day-to-day -day stuff. But then when you really want to take a look at what happened there, and then you drill into Wireshark. And uh, yeah, Wilson made his name as a science fiction author, uh, writing the Illuminatus trilogy, this uh, satirical conspiracy theories. Um, but he uh, really, is, his background, his PhD was in statistics. What is a hacker? Yeah, sometimes I don't know if I like being called a hacker. Uh, for one thing, people might think it's a bad thing. I don't want to be known as a bad guy. Um, but according to the RFC, uh, 2828, a glossary of terms, a hacker is someone who figures things out and makes something cool happen. Huh, sounds like a gung-ho song about to be released. Hypothetical. Um, yeah, uh, well, in my case, I don't mind being called a hacker. Uh, now I'm just worried of my good because I wouldn't want to be called something cool and, and other people are like, dude, that was not cool. So I do my best. Do my best. All right, our, our goal, we want to understand how we use encryption today. Uh, I want you to be an intelligent consumer and say, if I'm just teaching you how to drive a car, we're going to stay out of a uh, history of how uh, combustion engines work or, or how uh, Henry Ford uh, w w thought in school. Uh, there are very uh, vital things you need to know about how to uh, uh, read the signs and how to apply your brakes and things like that and just maintain your car. And these are the things we're going to stay at that level. Um, one of the challenges about encryption is understanding what it does for us. Now, the word crypt, crypt, it comes from the Greek. It means to hide. But actually, um, well, let's look at the very oldest encryption uh, method, symmetric encryption, where Bob and Alice say, share a secret key. All right, they both have a key, say, to this filing cabinet. No one can pick the lock. And uh, it's the same key. They're symmetric. And they can now hide messages. Bob could put something in there for Alice and vice versa, and, and they can get confidentiality. But we get another service because if Alice opens up the box and she sees something in there, she knows, well, I didn't put that in there. That must have come from Bob. That's authenticated. Right? Um, but Bob could put something in there, you know, maybe not malicious. Maybe this isn't Satan's law, but just uh, security, uh, Murphy's law, uh, uh, safety engineering. But maybe he put his uh, tuna fish sandwich in there. Uh, he was too lazy to go to the refrigerator, forgot about it, went out for lunch. Three-day weekend, Tuesday, Alice is very upset when her records smell like fish. Uh, she tells the boss, and the boss says, I didn't do that. He repudiates that. To repudiate is to deny, because he knows that Alice also has a copy of the key. He can say that she did it. Now, she'll know he's lying, but the third party won't. So in an asymmetric system, you don't have the same key that you give out to people. You have one that you keep to yourself and one that you give out, and they're related. If I lock it with my, my uh, private key, it can be unlocked with my public key, but you'll know my private key locked it. Now, if you want confidentiality, I would actually lock it with the receiver's public. But let's try this. I'm going to lock it with Bob's. He's going to put the tuna for sandwich in the cabinet, and he's going to lock it with his private key. Well, anybody can open it up, but they know, Bob, you can't deny putting that in there because you're the only one who had that private key. That had to be you. And in math, and on tests, typically, if you say asymmetric encryption provides non-repudiation because of that. But in operations, no, not really. Not so simple. Because uh, people could pick locks, uh, people could uh, get keys copied, and that happens all the time, right? Algorithms get cracked and keys get hacked. So, in theory, that's how it would work. Now, hashing's different. Hashing uses cryptographic math, but really just to give us integrity. Now, imagine, um, well, we say security is about three processes. I get to prevent, detect, and respond. Right. Prevention would be like, I have a safe that prevents you from getting to my money. Detection is I have burglar alarms that ring when you get to my money. 
or uh, response, I have uh, guards that show up within a reasonable time frame if I hear the alarm go off. Right? So these are uh, our security processes. But suppose I drop my car off at the parking lot and I give the parking lot attendant my keys. Well, prevention is out of the, the mix. I have no chance. So um, I uh, could take a picture of my car before I drop it off and take a picture when it comes back and make sure the pictures look the same, you know, count everything. Maybe I'm going to count uh, the mileage, right? The key to in integrity is measurements, right? To take measurements before and after, to take account. That's why our accounting rules, accounting, uh, are when you measure. I'm going to count for that. All right, let's take a look at how that might work. All right, so I have, uh, I'm going to create a file called uh, note pad hash test dot txt and I create a very simple file 0 through 9 I run md5 a hashing tool against this and I get some 128 bit message digest that's what md stands for message digest all right so I take my car to the parking lot that's that file and I take a picture of it and I make a hash of it and then I come back later to pick it up. But while I was gone, they made a change to my file, to my car. Maybe he just innocently moved a mirror. So I'm going to change a 0 to a 1. And I run MD5 against it again. And I get a different me message digest. I go, hey, something happened to my, my file, my car. Who, who moved my car? What'd they do? Oh, hang on, sir. It was nothing malicious. So you moved this mirror, whatever. So they, they put back everything the same as it was. And I get my original message digest, right? So the hash is not encrypting anything. It's called cryptography, but it doesn't crypt. Uh, it's there to check the integrity. Right? So the idea is I should be able to create a hash of, say, Service Pack 2 on Microsoft, send uh, somebody Service Pack 2, they create a hash, and we compare values. All right, as we say, packets do not lie. I can measure these. I can speak matter-of-factly about the measurements I make here. Uh, just a quick note on capture filters. Uh, if you're new to Wireshark or uh, work with capture filters, I don't like to work with them. Uh, one thing, the f syntax is a pain in the butt, but I also uh, it, it understand it's best practice to try and catch the other traffic. It might actually be meaningful later. Uh, I do uh, use this filter, uh, which is not my MAC address. All right. So we want to understand how to mix and match symmetric, asymmetric, and hashing algorithms to give us confidentiality, authenticity, integrity, and non-repudiation. Right? All crypto systems, whether it's SSL or SSH or SMIME or DNSSEC, they'll all mix and match one of each of these three algorithm types to give you those four services. Right? And we can measure this with Wireshark and speak matter-of-factly. Uh, here I use the uh, filter ssl.handshake.ciphersuites. This will list out what the browser is capable of. So when I connect to an SSL server, um, most of the stuff you'll see with Wireshark can be filtered with the SSL handshake uh, display filter. But Cypher Suites will tell you what did the client say they were capable of. Uh, Cypher Suite will be what the server picks to say, here's what I would like you to do all things being equal there. All right, so symmetric encryption. Bob wants to share a secret with Alice. And first, they have to agree on the shared key. This is a paradox because I want to give you private messages. And in order to get the private messages, say you need a password. I'm going to set you up for email. I'm going to set you a private mail and you need a password. And you know what I can't mail you? Your password. Because you won't know how to get in it. So I have to give it to you on a yellow sticky a.k.a. the out-of-band key exchange. Right? That's one of the challenges with symmetric encryption. One of the fundamental challenges, how do you initially share the secret? And in the song that uh, got me this gig, uh, by the way, Crypto, uh, that's exactly what happens. Bob says, I want to share a secret with you, Alice, but first we want to, I want you to agree. And, well, you can figure out what I really meant by that. By the way, that's the gig that got me this uh, Thing. So I had recorded a song, uh, Crypto, Packets Don't Lie, and later on my band did it. And um, I got some funny comments uh, from people uh, who said, oh, you've got to do this at, at uh, Shark Fest. So I won't play this, but uh, you can see I've got quite a few comments there, and thumbs up. And, yeah, it was kind of funny. So um, 
Bob wants to share that secret and he wants Alice to agree. Yeah, well, the strength of encrypting things symmetrically is it's much faster, on a magnitude of a thousand times faster than an asymmetric system. But we have the challenges. Now, I mentioned key agreement. How do I initially share the secret key? When we get to asymmetric encryption, the very first public algorithm is Diffie-Hellman for asymmetric encryption. Its only job was to encrypt or share session keys, all right, the symmetric keys. Its job was to meet that first bullet here. All right, Diffie-Hellman is a key agreement protocol. RSA can do that, but RSA can also encrypt a hash value. And that gives us our digital signature. We'll talk more about that later. There's another issue with symmetric encryption. It doesn't scale well. So if I had, say, um, uh, three routers, I want them to share secrets on VPN. Well, router A will share a secret with B and with C, and, and B and C will share a secret. But every time I add a router, I have to share, well, it won't have to share with itself. So if it's the fifth router, I have to share four more. Well, that's a pretty uh, exponential growth. So, for example, example, if I had six routers, well, six times five is 30 to 15. But if I had 10, uh, 10 times 9 is 90, 45, by the time I hit 1,000, I did half a million keys. Uh, if this were an asymmetric system, one key pair for every entity. 1,000 routers, 1,000 key pairs. So that makes it a lot easier to manage. So for authentication, we really prefer asymmetric encryption. And this is what PKI we're going to get to is. So when I give out my public key, it's going to be there to authenticate me uh, very often. All right. Uh, security services, I get confidentiality. And I give it a limited form of authenticity. Alice will know it's Bob. But Bob could blame Alice. Yeah, when we authenticate, that's another thing. Now, if I authenticate, we're going to talk about authenticating an IP header. Uh, I can do that by creating a hash on the IP header and authenticating it symmetrically because the source and destination address are written right in the header. But if it's an email or something, or if it's a service pack, you have to authenticate that asymmetrically, and that's why they sign those things. All right, uh, asymmetric encryption, Alice creates a key pair. So uh, she keeps one to herself, that's her private key, and whatever she locks with that, the public key can decrypt it. Well, if the fundamental challenge of a uh, symmetric system was sharing the symmetric key, here, I, I, I don't have that. Here, take the public key. I don't have to make that out of band. Anyone could have it. But how do you know it's really me? I could have written Barack Obama on that. So you really need a trusted third party to validate public keys in this system. All right, that public, uh, uh, the, the way the public key infrastructure works, PKI, is this is here to validate your X.500 name. The reason I trust that it is, say, a www.amazon.com is because when I get their public key, when I go to them, I get their certificate and I check this ID card. So that's what we're going to do a lot. We're going to check the ID card in here. All right. So uh, your um, X.509 is your the reason you are this leaf object uh, your your certificate on the X that 500 tree uh, X 500 tree and this is your public key uh, a bit longer than just say two of these six bits isn't it and we can see this is the ID card for uh, mail.dougal.com I've got a version X 509 version 3 the serial number very important for us that's a good field to focus in on the signature, this was signed, that means someone created a hash, in this case with the secure hashing algorithm, but then encrypted it with their RSA private key. So somebody, some trusted third party, and we'll see who that was, uh, and that would be under issuer if I exploit that out. Validity would give us the dates that this uh, driver's license or this ID card is valid, and the subject, again, is who uses it, and again, this is to prove that it's mail.google.com. So on your driver's license, you have a picture of you, and the policeman or whatever would look and see if your picture matches that. Well, here, the systems look at DNS and say, is this really mail.google.com's IP address? Uh, and then the public key, and we'll, we'll look a little further into that. The advantage over symmetric, I don't care who sees my public key, they can all have it. But if key distribution um, is easy uh, in terms of I don't have to make it secret, it's still a challenge that you have to trust that, that public key really belongs to who they claim it is. Right? It's an ID card and people spoof IDs and make phony ID cards. It doesn't scale very well, or excuse me, it does scale much better. It's one key pair for everybody. Yeah, 1,000 routers, 1,000 key pairs. And it provides non-repudiation, assuming keys weren't hacked or, or, or you know, stolen somehow. But it is much slower, again, 1,000 times slower. So we really don't encrypt large amounts of data here. What I'm going to encrypt for key agreement is a symmetric key. 
or for validating a hash value, a, a hash. So I, again, I'll encrypt a symmetric key with the receiver's public, and now I can share that symmetric key. Or I can encrypt a hash with the sender's private, and everybody can know that that hash came from me. Um, but it's also uh, the challenge I need a trusted third party. Now, we're supposed to do things the way the Federation, I call them, the ISO, that's the International Organization for Standardization. They um, uh, have created the public key infrastructure, a hierarchical trust model that allows us to have, kind of like the Department of Motor Vehicles, stamp uh, a, a key. It's, it's a digitally signed public key. Um, and these are kind of, again, analogous to the DMV uh, doing these things. Um, and it's the way the Federation wants us. But uh, I don't know. I think the Spock part of my brain, if you're a Star Trek fan, would understand it. The Spock part of my brain thinks that's very logical. But the Kirk part of my brain doesn't feel so good because most Kirk might say, I've never met Verisign, Spock. I trust Flanagan from the Intrepid. He's a good man. Went to the Academy together. So uh, in PGP, your friends are, are the guys you trust. And one's not better. It depends. Sometimes I don't trust the government as much as I trust my friends. Not even close. And vice versa. Like when it comes to drinking alcohol, my friends give me some bad advice there. Right. All right. So um, the uh, I've used the filter here now. Uh, SSL handshake, which is a great one to start with. Certificate. Now this is going to give me ID cards. So now I get to see whose uh, cards are here. And let's see. Capture here, and what's nice about these things is you can save them now in Wireshark 1.7 and above. So it look like a certificates, and I've saved that capture. That's pretty cool. And it's uh, pretty much the same thing for the X.509 Information Framework ID field. Just taking a look at that. All right, now uh, Cipher Suite. I said is what the server would pick. So let's take a look at the cipher suite I've captured here. And actually, I want the SSL handshake, not, not the full cipher the certificate here. And on the client hello is when you uh, see what the client supports. And we want to see. How many cipher suites? Now, 34 suites. I know this is uh, likely a, a Mozilla, even though that says IE8. That is not IE8. All right. Now, for years, people would pick a type 4 by default. Uh, that means I'm going to use RSA as my asymmetric algorithm. I'll use RC4 at 128 bits as my symmetric algorithm, and MD5 as the hash. But the server gets to pick it what they did decide. And in this case, uh, they stuck with RSA and RC4, but they changed the hash value to uh, from MD5 to SHA. But let's go back to that and look at that. Um, I said that uh, Diffie-Hellman um, can only do key agreement. So uh, if we use asymmetric systems for two things, one to do a key agreement and the other to encrypt a hash or sign, then in this case Diffie-Hellman will be used to agree on this AES 128-bit uh, symmetric key, but RSA will be used as the signing key to encrypt this SHA hash. So that's why sometimes you'll see uh, two asymmetric algorithms. Um, we really need to move to elliptical curve. It's far more efficient. And um, when we use elliptical curve as a uh, key agreement protocol, they paid a little homage to Diffie-Hellman. It's elliptical curve as a Diffie-Hellman exchange, but when we use it as a signing key, it's elliptical curve as a digital signature algorithm. I'm going to use AES as my symmetric key, and again, SHA here, be a hash. And these are the things your client will tell the server it's capable of. But the server will pick. Now, as I can tell is Google. Uh, Google's the only one I know who's moved to elliptical curve, at least for key agreement. Um, but I think it's the CAs are having caught up to get us signing keys that are elliptical curves. So we've got to get them working on that. All right Now, where to encrypt? It depends on your needs. I can encrypt my whole hard drive. That would be, uh, say, the presentation layer. I use TrueCrypt. I could have the application do things for me. Maybe I have... Um, uh, an SFTP application where it'll encrypt the data for me, or my email clients, SMIME, OpenPGP, SSH. I could uh, take my, say, clear text uh, HTML and encrypt it over SSL. I do that with my POP3 and my SMT SMTP mail. It's all done over uh, SSL, TLS. Uh, IPsec does everything behind an IP packet editor. 
And we have a couple ways to do that. I could say encrypt everything here uh, and then decrypt it when I want to talk to you and have this secure transport. But I don't really like doing that for a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, I can't run IDS when anything come out of the workstation. It's a lot of cumbersome stuff touching the workstation. So usually I find most people do. They keep everything clear here. And then as it leaves the perimeter of a network, some border device, some router, VPN appliance or whatever, uh, firewall can then add its own packet header on top of it and tunnel everything through that. And that's tunnel mode. Um, link layer is a little tricky. Now, for me, I don't have a problem. I use Wi-Fi, say, here, and it's encrypted till it gets here, and it's everything behind the frame header. But uh, if it needed to traverse routers, that wouldn't work. Now, Wi-Fi doesn't do that, right? So we go WPA2, or if you have some WPA or WEP around, you're going to be encrypted at the link layer here, but then the, the access point decrypts it, and we can look up the packet headers. If you're trying to do link layer encryption like the military or some ISPs do, and you have to go all the way through, well, you're going to have to decrypt it at every router hop. Look at the packet header, re-encrypt it. Very cumbersome. Now, uh, Bob wants to encrypt an email to Alice, and he could encrypt everything with her public key. She'd be the only one to read it, but that's very slow. So uh, no matter what system you're using, if it's uh, S-MIME, PGP, uh, you're still going to have your uh, client generate some pseudo-random number. Let's think of a number. It's 128 bits long. I'm only going to use it on this email. It's a, it's a nonce. It's a number used once. All right, so this is my symmetric key, and I encrypt the data with it. And it's like the one-time pad. It's only going to be used on this. Now, how do I get the key to Alice? Well, I don't want to use the yellow sticky. Since that's only like 128 bits, I'll encrypt that with her public key. Right? So now we have hybrid encryption. Pretty cool. So Alice, to get it back, uh, she can get the key sharing uh, advantage of, of uh, here, just take it. You know, we're not going to worry. You've got my public key. So using her private key, she can decrypt that symmetric session key. Only she could have gotten it. It was encrypted with her public. Only her private can decrypt it. And now, uh, using this session key, she could decrypt this message. Now, this key won't be used again. It was only used for this one message. Uh, pretty cool. All right, now we're going to check the integrity with hashing algorithms. And I can take any size input, uh, a CV, CD or DVD, run it through MD5, I'll get some 128-bit digest. Of course, that was cracked in 2004, but we can move to SHA, which wasn't cracked in 2005, but they have stronger versions. All right, anyway. If I run a hash by itself, like I took a picture of my car, and then I come back and pick it up, I cannot trust that picture. I can trust it. It was, you know, both pictures I took. But suppose I bought the car on the Internet, and the seller took a picture of the car, and he put it in the glove compartment, and then the delivery man is supposed to drop off the car, and uh, I take a picture of it, and then I look at the picture in the glove compartment, I compare the two hash values. And if the delivery man had scratched it, I'd notice. But the problem is, how do I know that the delivery man didn't scratch it, take a new picture, and put it in the glove compartment, and replace the original? So hash values sometimes have to be authenticated. And I can authenticate it um, symmetrically, and I would have a message authentication code. And that's that's fine for like IPsec, where I have this HMAC, a hashed message authentication code. I add a value, some symmetric number. I hash the two numbers together, my IP header and this number. I salt them, right? and then I uh, I have this keyed hash. Right? Share the key with Alice. She gets the IP header. She does the same thing. And now if they work, we're fine because I don't worry about non-repudiation here again. An IP packet header has a source and destination address. If the hash didn't fail, we know where it came from. But that doesn't work in, say, a um, virus signature update or a service pack or an email. So a digital signature is when I take this hash value that we created and it's fixed on, and encrypt this with the sender's private. That's when they, they're signing it. All right, so if you just get a message digest, it's not authenticated. A Mac is authenticated symmetrically, and a digital signature is authenticated asymmetrically. All right. Mac will give us, again, the, uh, those integrity and authenticity, uh, but because the salt is a symmetric number, that's some pseudo-random nonce, uh, it would technically, like in an email, would not give us a uh, non-repudiation. All right, so uh, if it all worked, though, um, well, actually, what I can say is if it fails, if they don't match, then either the key isn't really from Bob, so this didn't come, come from Bob, or the message was altered. 
but again, in um, getting a service pack, a device driver. These things need to be signed. So say Microsoft creates service pack two. Right? They create a hash of this. They encrypt the hash with their private key, and now they have signed that hash. So they send to you the service pack, the signature, and their public key. Right? You create a hash of the service pack, and then you decrypt theirs. And if they come out the same, then the document likely did not change. It came from Microsoft. Microsoft can't blame anybody else. Think about that. A digital signature gives you three of the four reasons we shopped at the crypto mart, and it didn't encrypt anything. Very tough for people. You know, if we use words where uh, it's misleading, and I have engineers sit in my classes for years and have a hard time with this, I wonder where our politicians and our lawyers are, are uh, with this stuff. All right, uh, so now again, I looked at the certificate and I wanted to see who issued this driver's license. Who signed? Who's the trusted third party? That's a thought. Well, why would I trust thought? Well, because Microsoft told me how to trust them. They are uh, ISO approved certificate authorities and Microsoft let me know that by pre-shipping their public keys on my system. So they're allowed to do that. They're signing. They're an ISO approved entity. Okay. Uh, yeah, Spock likes that. It looks very logical, but to Kirk, not so much. Right. These algorithms get hacked. People's keys get compromised. I've been to Windows Update many, many times. I've been told I had to install this update or else somebody would be able to read something off my machine without being authorized to do so. So very, very tricky to trust all this. Um, there's no right answer. You know, sometimes I trust uh, PKI better. Sometimes I would recommend PGP. And neither is perfect. All right. This is the way the Federation wants us to do it, though, the ISO, right? Uh, now, at a very simple level, this could be my company, and this could be Alice's company. Did I mention I was Bob? Uh, you mentioned I never said Alice is loved Bob. It was a one-sided thing. Anyway, um, the root CA would be like VeriSign. Of course, in a larger environment, uh, this could be different divisions of my organization, but at a very simple level. All right, so who is the issuer? And we could see Thought is the signer of this key. Why do I really trust them? VeriSign is not really the root. Certificate authorities are not the root of the trust model. They got the right to be certificate authorities from the policy certification authorities, and they got the right from the Internet Policy Registration Authority that I can't find anymore. When I could, they look like this. And I was like, Mike, this is the root of all trust. Something a guy did in Notepad, and I said, Larry, get old of yourself. You can't make font changes like that in Notepad. That had to be WordPad. Uh, that would be Jeff Schiller. And you can get, uh, thank you, Jeff, the IPRA certificate by downloading here. And oh boy. <coughs> now, I'm not a doomsdayer. I believe we will figure things out and make something cool happen. But PKI, which I think is the best thing I know of to validate who's who on the internet, is uh, less secure than Swiss cheese today, and it's getting worse because heat's building up and it's melting the Swiss cheese. But we will figure things out. We will make something cool happen. Another big thing is, suppose your private key was compromised. Now somebody's signing things and they make it look like it comes from you. Besides loss of life, loss of reputation is your worst loss. So just like if a driver's license is revoked, they put it on a list. It is not printed on the license. I can look at things on the certificate, but I can't see if it's revoked. I can find out where on the certificate uh, I can get that. Now let's try that. So if we go to certificates, a very nice... Um, field you look at here, the extensions will let us know where to check for revocation. So I'm going to open all trees here. And one of them is pretty intuitive. That's called CRL distribution points. And under there you could say, well, I could go to crl.thought.com and download that list. And uh, that list got really long, and I would check to see if my, my key was on there, but it got so long it slowed things down, and Microsoft came up with a neat way to um, speed up performance. If you go to Advanced and turn that off, things are much faster. 
Uh, that was an IE6, by the way. And uh, I, I would uh, check if you still have IE6 or any XP sitting around and make sure that that's been fixed. Um, remember our certificate uh, had a, uh, oops, our certificate had a serial number associated with it, right? So, um, well, I, I could have checked, is the serial number good? Right? Where's my serial number right here? And I just say, hey, how about is the is serial number good? Don't give me the entire list. Well, that's the online certificate status protocol, and that's buried under a weirder named uh, authority info access syntax, and I could go to ocsp.thought.com. And not all the time does that work, and I forget if this tree did, OCSP. Yes, we did have one. So there was a request. Let's just expand that. Uh, is this serial number good? Uh, is this serial number good? And the reply came back and said, uh, successful, yeah. And yes, the certificate is good. There we go. Search status. So I requested the status. It's an online certificate status protocol. And on that, I said it was good. And that sounds good. Um, but uh, the problem is all browsers are configured to fail soft, so if I can't get to the CRL or the OCSP responder, we let you pass anyway. Right? It's like the cop says, let me check this ID. Hmm, I can't get a hold of your uh, Department of Motor Vehicles to see if this has been revoked or not. You must be good. Go ahead. Now, I don't know if that's wrong. I'm just telling you, you know, awareness is your number one countermeasure. If you weren't aware, that's how it works. Upstream servers all, all, all frequently block access to these. The CAs themselves have had certificates compromised. So I showed you the trusted list uh, of certificates. If we uh, go back to that, there is an untrusted list, and for years, there was only two on there. And it's kind of funny, the first time I dealt with certificates, it was a very science certificate issue, and I had to uh, get VPN uh, with, uh, for a hospital. I had to build a, a remote access VPN, and then do a client server certificate, so they're going to do mutual authentication. Great idea. Clients would prove that they are the doctors, and the, uh, the VPN concentrator would prove I am indeed the proper VPN endpoint at the hospital. And um, after I got the VPN up, I wanted to work from home, so I requested that my client contact me. He said, sure, here's the letter I got from VeriSign. And I call, uh, actually, I go through uh, the setup procedure. I need the uh, admin cert, you know, and, and go to the website and, and call this phone number, and I call and I explain my issue. I'm sorry, we can only speak to Bob. And I said, well, Bob's not very technical. That's why I'm sorry, sir. That's how it works. So I just called back and I said, this is Bob. And she said, here, point your browser to this location. This gentleman did it and pretended to be Microsoft and got two subordinate root certs. Lovely. But then in 2010, I believe it was, did you know TAR got hacked? They're a certificate authority. And they were giving out keys, little known uh, companies. I don't know if you've ever heard of mail.google.com, Yahoo. You ever hear of these guys? They're little known. Oh, lovely. Not a doomsday. It's an MD5 and SHA, which they use, and their signatures are hacked. And I presented this in 2012 at Sharkfest, and I said, how long before somebody creates phony service packs and makes it look like it came from Microsoft? And uh, actually, it had already been done. I didn't realize it. It came out in the news like a week later. That was the flame virus. So that's exactly what happened. Flame was a little crafty. I couldn't think of how I could get you to run my evil service pack. They hacked the Windows Update Protocol. So if you uh, have auto update on, you're always running whoops and you're multitasking. Am I, uh, or do you have a patch for me? And the hacker said, yes. And these hackers appear to be from the uh, United States and Israel because they infected Iran. Yeah, neat stuff. Um, but we'll figure it out. We're going to make something cool out of it. All right, so we looked at some OCSP stuff here. Why? Is this list hard coded? I didn't think about that, but some other people brought that up at the tour project and they said, What are you telling us about, say, certificate revocation? And apparently, they're telling us that it doesn't work. So you could read this on your own, there's a lot more to it, but uh, I basically summarize here Does certificate revocation really work? No, it does not. So we've got to fix this, and I'm sure we will. 
where are we going? I told you I'm not a doomsdayer. Uh, when I was a kid, I read a uh, book, um, actually, uh, martial arts, uh, my martial arts instructor gave me a book by Timothy Leary, which was basically a review of The High Frontier by Jared O'Neill, so then I, uh, or an extrapolation of that, uh, and then I bought those books and, and uh, changed my life. Um, Jared O'Neill is a, a Princeton um, a professor who was worried about in the mid 70s of what is this high tech lifestyle that we're moving into doing to our environment and what is the best way to handle this and he approached global warming and and, and uh, his students worked with it and they came up with a solution that, uh, that kind of threw him. He expected to either go back to simpler technologies or um, maybe greener technologies and that's not what they thought. They thought, no, actually uh, you got to manufacture. Manufacturing uh, requires uh, a quite a, a big effort. It's going <clears> to <throat> continue to impact the environment unless we move manufacturing to space. And that was, wow, really, yeah. And we got another reason why we need to manufacture in space. Because they looked at, besides alleviating better than 90% of the pollution, because that's coming from manufacturing, um, most of the energy for it is f spent fighting gravity, gravity when they manufacture. So it's actually cheaper to manufacture when you get it in zero G. And... Um, when you have a mold that uh, takes a while uh, compounds to gel, well these compounds uh, will get corrupted because heavier elements will sink to the bottom. So you actually get better product, cheaper, safer. And that's, that's a win-win for everybody. So Leary read this and um, felt that uh, Gerald was, was right on track and that it was actually to him a very natural phase of evolution. He said just, uh, a, a, you know, when we look at um, the first astronauts in space, it'll be as significant as the first fish that smelled air. You know, so he just felt that we, we come from, uh, we're, we're living in a time frame we're about to migrate from the womb planet. So pretty interesting. And to him, that's what the revelation is. That truth is revealed. Um, well, I, I Google around, uh, you know, for Jared O'Neill stuff, and, and I see that there's a Japanese cartoon based on it. And I asked a friend if they knew about it. I said, oh, yeah, it's one of the uh, top, if not the number one cartoon in all of Japan, Mobile Suit Gundam. So uh, pretty neat. They t it takes place in, in worlds. Uh, now, there are three versions of his space colonies. Uh, one that you see here is known as Island One. It can hold 10,000 people. So these are the people who would work in those space factories. Um, it's a long commute, right? Uh, Island Two is known as a Stanford Taurus, and it would can hold up to 100,000. And Island Three, the O'Neill Cylinder, up to 20 million people. And that's where they, a good deal of this takes place on those colonies, and there's dozens of them that they had built and mobile some kind of pretty neat. And that came out in 79. Well, now I see a commercial for a new movie. It's not even out yet, but Matt Damon and um, Jodie Foster, uh, Elysium, Elysium, and it takes place in a Stanford Tours. I saw the, 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 I went to see Star Trek and I saw the, the, the previews and I was like, oh, here it goes, dude, it goes. I'm loving it, so it looks really cool. It's really cool. Uh, so just as far from there, he says, uh, uh, I'll read the whole thing here, but I, I like this. He said, um, men and women who know from whence they come and where they are going, who share a vision beyond the local mundane, will emerge from the larval gene pools and as cyber pilot individuals will learn quickly, work effectively, go, grow naturally, socialize lovingly, and evolve gracefully. And he called that cyber pilot back in 76 Okay, he's way, way ahead of the uh, the internet. Uh, I mentioned Bruce Schneier, um, <laughs> great great uh, uh, cryptographer, and uh, like a, uh, the facts they have for Chuck Norris, they have similar uh, heroic uh, deeds by Bruce Schneier, and I like a couple of these, I won't read them all, but I like uh, uh, Bruce Schneier's secure handshake is so strong, you won't be able to exchange keys with anyone else for days. But what is this one? Well, I fed it into a tool called CryptTool. And I see that's all just text, right? I don't see any, like, extended ASCII or anything like that. Um, I figured it's pretty simple. I tried it with the Caesar cipher and tried to decrypt it. And it came back as, if you ask Bruce Schneier to decrypt this, he'd crush your skull with his laugh. <laughs> all righty. Thank you very much for coming. I hope uh, you enjoyed the uh, talk. And... Uh, happy uh, encrypting. And as I said, I'm not a uh, doomsdayer. Um, I do a lot of work with the Department of Defense, and particularly I work with the Marines. It's a great honor. My uh, teacher, uh, my late teacher, Joe Lois, was a Marine, and always said, I'm a Marine first, martial artist second. And uh, of course, I learned this from a uh, Clint Eastwood movie, Heartbreak Ridge, but you know, you don't, you don't sit there and complain about life. You, you improvise, you adapt, you overcome. We'll figure things out. We'll make something cool happen. 
Thank you very much. Take care.